Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. J.J. Rose is a lifelong, no-nonsense psychic and energy clearer who uses YouTube to share her wisdom. No, she's not here to predict your future or help you find love. J.J.'s role in this world is much more dynamic. The paranormal has been J.J.'s whole life. She comes from a long line of individuals with abilities. This means she was taught from an early age how to best understand her abilities and how to use them. J.J. specializes in energy and entity clearing. This means she focuses on clearing individual energies, removing attachments, and performing an occasional exorcism. While she may not be able to teach you how to perform an exorcism, J.J. does her best to teach you how to properly clear your energy and protect yourself from spiritual attachments. Oh, and she has something to say about demons, too. Before going further, let's address anybody thinking that all of this is woo-woo and ridiculous. I've got two truths for you. First, J.J. believes in the marriage of science and spirituality. She says that science is constantly trying to prove what spirituality is known. Both are important. J.J. does not discredit science and uses scientific evidence to support what she talks about in her channel. For instance, there is a scientific reason why salt is used for protection, and she explains how and why. She also points out that science understands that everything has an energy signature, what we refer to as frequency or vibration. There's also a mutual relationship between everything via these vibrations. String theory explains how this works and how we are all connected. And as humans, we crave to be connected. It's one of the things we search for the most, if not with other humans, then with animals, and if not those, then with the supernatural. So what J.J. speaks about isn't out there. Second, the paranormal is spiritual. If you don't understand this, then there's a great portion of the paranormal you will never comprehend. J.J. says it's like saying you want an omelet, but you don't believe in eggs. There is no difference between the spiritual and the paranormal, according to J.J. If the paranormal is the big umbrella term, then the spiritual deals with the spirit realm under that umbrella. Hence, spiritual. Spirituality is a practice where you then try to understand this realm, its connection to you, and how to interact with it. So if you believe in the paranormal but not the spiritual, then you're missing the point. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, let's continue. How exactly does J.J. help others? Through personal consults, classes, and YouTube, of course, J.J.'s channel, J.J. Rose 777, is the resource for learning about the spirit world, its hierarchy, protection methods, and energy clearing. She began her channel in May of 2022. Originally, she and her paranormal partner, we're going to do a series of videos where she would be on camera. She and her partner recorded on three different days for 12 hours each day. They had the whole gamut of equipment and help, which resulted in dozens of hours of great content. A PA was always present, making sure the cameras and audio were constantly tested on site. All was good. However, once the PA got home to review the footage, JJ's face would never be in full view and the audio wasn't usable. After all those hours were wasted, 
She felt Spirit was telling her that she needed to work alone and not be on camera. Thus, she began her faceless channel. She started the account thinking she was only going to post seven videos to say what she needed to say and be done. At that time, she had no social media presence. She simply didn't think she needed it. However, around the same time, she heard an interview with Archbishop Christina Rake on a podcast. This was the first time she heard someone from the church and a female say that it was okay to be psychic like her. J.J. hadn't gotten much of that before. This interview was so validating and moving that J.J. emailed the podcaster and thanked him for having Bishop Christina Rake on the show. Who was the podcaster? Eric Salagi from Uncomfortable. After his interview with J.J., Eric was stunned, and he urged J.J. to have social media so that she could reach others with her gift. Thanks to Eric, J.J. has a YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. However, don't expect to see a gaudy and woo-woo YouTube channel. No, that's not J.J.'s style at all. J.J. prefers to stay hidden from the camera so that all the attention is placed on the content. There are no sale points, no marketing. It's just straight information and wisdom. The way she sees it is that her videos and message will find the right people at the right time. She's just there to make sure the information is made accessible and usable to you. She wants to save you from anyone who will charge you an exorbitant amount and only tell you half-truths. J.J. is always willing to talk to anyone who may be feeling low or may have signs of an entity attachment. She'll help do that for you for a very reasonable price. She says it's the worst business model because she doesn't want repeat customers, ever. She wants to make sure that if you have an entity attached, she can help clear it away and then give you the techniques for you to protect yourself. As for the energy clearing process, it will look different for everyone. For instance, if you're just feeling stuck or in a rut, then she'll teach you how to remove those negative vibes so that you don't have to pay someone to do it for you. She has a video on how to do this posted on her YouTube channel. She also offers classes over Zoom where she goes more in-depth. When it comes to spiritual attachments, things get a little trickier. It's important to note that while some attachments are negative, some can be positive. Sometimes what you may feel is an attachment is just your spirit team stepping up and taking the wheel. She says this can feel foreign and odd, but it's not a bad thing. You just need to remember spirit doesn't work the same way we do, and it's easy to confuse this with something negative. It's only after a while that you'll realize there was a lesson. When it comes to negative attachments, J.J. wants everyone to know that there is a spiritual hierarchy. If there's anything she wants you to take away from her YouTube channel is that you understand a hierarchy exists in the spirit realm and not everything is automatically a demon. So how does this work? For the average person, there are levels of attachments and things that want to attach on the negative side. One must understand that different entities vibe at different frequencies. Lower vibing entities or negative entities typically seek out other lower vibing frequencies. These lower vibes are what provide a food source. To sustain these entities, they must always have a food source. And when are humans vibing low? During periods of grief, abrupt changes, anger, life-altering events, resentment, sadness, and even certain hormonal shifts, among others. If you're not on top of your protection game, then it's easier to attract a negative entity, which can then attach itself to you. The first entities that will attach are what J.J. calls scouts. They're the ones on the ground looking for prey. Once a source is scouted, the entity latches on and does what it can to keep the individual in a low-energy state. This can feel like constant fatigue, negative circular thinking about life, feeling stuck, or even feeling unlucky and unworthy. Any attempt to get help or feel better is typically blocked because the entity will do what it can to keep its food source. The longer you stay in that state, the more likely you'll attract more negative entities. It's also important to note that many people who are vibing low tend to like to hang out in bars and clubs, 
where many types of spirits are present, if you get my drift. As you drink, you become more open and vulnerable to attachment, and this is one of the most common ways that these scouts find others to attach to. Now, if you get enough entities on you, it's like sending out the bat signal. Once other entities are alerted of this food source, that's when you start getting entities that are higher up on the hierarchy interested in you. Now, not demons, not yet. However, if this keeps up, then you will eventually attract the attention of one. But this is incredibly rare, and it takes a long time to get there. Speaking of demons, JJ wants to clarify a few things. First, it's important to address that having a demon attached or finding a demon isn't something to boast about. Second, demons and negative entities don't just hang out in dark forests and abandoned places. Third, calling something a demon is only giving it more power. Stop. Stop calling things by names. Additionally, JJ finds it astounding how people will go places and demand entities communicate, especially in an aggressive way. Like attracts like, and if you get aggressive or demanding, that's the energy you're going to get in return, even if it's a benevolent energy. Also, if you're going to open up a session with a Ouija board or any other communication tool, then know how to properly close the session and protect yourself. This way you're not going home with a bunch of new friends. The lesson? Don't mess with what you don't understand. Educate yourself first. So I asked JJ why everyone thinks it's always a demon. The answer? Misinformation and the church. JJ states that some churches have twisted and perverted spiritual warfare so much that either people don't believe in it or it's been politicized and bastardized. The church is notoriously bad at educating the public about the hierarchy that exists in the spirit realm. They also are infamously good at instilling fear in the masses, especially by using the words demon and devil. The masses will listen and believe whatever the church says without doing the research themselves and reading the Gospels, the Gnostic texts, or the history of ancient civilizations. The ancients talked about the nuances of the spirit realm. We just aren't paying attention. Also, ego is a big factor. It seems that in the paranormal sphere, it becomes cool to say you found a demon. It provides recognition or clout. It's as if having a demon is the coolest and best thing an investigator can find. JJ says that if you did attract a demon, it means you are spiritually dirty, your energy is super low, and the amount of negative things that had to happen for you to get there is a lot so maybe think twice before claiming you've got demons. In the end, JJ's goal is to help you get protected and fight fear. She believes knowledge is power, and the best way to fight against and protect yourself from anything negative in the spirit realm is via the application of knowledge. JJ's biggest lesson and advice she can share is for you to obtain good, unbiased information so you can best understand what paranormal phenomena is happening to you and the lesson that comes with it. Do your homework and know there's always a bigger reason for your experiences. Determine what it is, what it means, and why it came to you. Take a look at how it changes you for the better and do not live in fear. And a good place to start is on her YouTube channel. Playlists are available for you to navigate easily. There's something for those who are just beginning, for investigators, and even for more advanced. She may have a small following, but don't let that take away from the invaluable information and content provided. JJ is doing her part to bring more light and positivity out into this world. She is the last of her line. This is her gift. This is her legacy. Be sure to support JJ on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Her handle for all of them is JJRose777. If you need energy or entity clearing, you can DM her or email her at LightJJRose777 at gmail.com. Nestled in the serene confines of Miami, Florida, the Terracotta House of the Witherspoons concealed a dark and harrowing reality. Within its walls, violence thrived, 
perpetrated by Carrington Witherspoon, a man whose rage knew no bounds. Yet on one fateful night, the dynamics shifted, leaving a trail of mystery and unease that lingered long after tragedy struck. The Witherspoons lived in a terracotta house in Miami, Florida. Whilst the setting may have been an idyllic paradise, life inside the family home was both violent and terrifying. Carrington Witherspoon was an abusive husband and father who terrorized his family on a regular basis. Furniture would be upturned on a regular basis in fits of uncontrolled rage. On an occasion, in a fit of anger, Carrington Witherspoon fired a shotgun at his family. On February 25, 1962, the house once again erupted in violence with the sound of furniture breaking in loud shots. Carrington unleashed his fury on his teenage son by beating him with a chair. Suddenly, a shot rang out. This time, however, it was not Carrington Witherspoon holding the weapon in his hand, but the hand of Mrs. Witherspoon, who stood over the bleeding body of her husband, having fired the fatal shot. A subsequent trial for homicide would end with an acquittal, given there were too many witnesses who testified to the violent physical abuse the family suffered at the hands of Carrington Witherspoon. For the families that moved into the Witherspoon house following these events, they would discover how true it is that violent and sudden deaths can create a haunting. Sounds of furniture crashing would regularly break the silence of the family home. More terrifying were the reports of furniture moving by unseen hands. A feeling of despair and discomfort often settled over those present with no obvious cause. A foul smell that permeated the house remained equally elusive as to the cause. Were these experiences caused by an echo of the violence seen and remembered in the fabric of the building, or a sign that Carrington Witherspoon continued his torment from the afterlife? As the Witherspoon house bore witness to unspeakable atrocities, its walls became the silent spectators of a family's descent into darkness. While justice may have evaded Carrington Witherspoon in the earthly realm, the haunting legacy he left behind continues to puzzle and disturb. Through tales of moving furniture and inexplicable despair, the Witherspoon House stands as a testament to the enduring grip of trauma and the lingering echoes of violence. Whether it is the remnants of past anguish or a spectral reminder of Carrington's malevolence, one thing remains certain. The Witherspoon House holds secrets that defy explanation, leaving those who dare to dwell within its confines forever haunted by the specter of its troubled past. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles, and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. Interstate 4, the 132-mile artery connecting Florida's east and west coasts, has earned a chilling reputation over the years due to a deadly quarter-mile stretch of Interstate 4 in Sanford, Florida. This portion of highway bears an ominous nickname, the Dead Zone, thanks to its alarming fatality rate that has taken over a thousand lives in the last decade alone. In addition, the area carries an eerie mystique. Tales of ghosts and paranormal activity shroud the freeway. 
For motorists, a drive through the Interstate 4 dead zone brings legitimate risks and perhaps some supernatural risks as well. The quarter-mile stretch stands as the most perilous thanks to design flaws. The road curves sharply as traffic is coming onto the highway. Congestion, reckless driving, and even paranormal intervention, depending on who one asks. All these factors have coalesced into a perfect storm for devastating high-speed accidents. Around this metropolitan corridor, I-4 narrows significantly while traffic increases. Additionally, off-ramps and overpasses further obstruct drivers' view. With heavy congestion, drivers frequently change lanes erratically at high speeds. Welcome to Florida. If the staggering death toll wasn't ominous enough, many people have shared stories of supernatural phenomena along this haunted highway only amplifying the lure. The legend is the shores of Lake Monroe once welcomed German pioneers who purchased 640 acres of land from developer Henry Sanford. The immigrants established St. Joseph's Catholic colony in the late 1800s, but their dreams soon soured. Disease ran rampant while failure hounded their agricultural efforts. A horrific outbreak of yellow fever in 1887 took many lives and led the disheartened survivors to abandon the colony. They buried their dead and moved on, leaving the land to be reclaimed by forest. The land changed hands several times, eventually becoming part of the city of Sanford. Over time, local legend transformed the site into a cautionary tale. Stories spread of dire fates befalling those who disturbed the forgotten graves. When the state of Florida began acquiring land for a new highway, the former site of St. Joseph's Colony was slated for development. Though the long-forgotten settlers' graves were initially marked for proper relocation, they were either forgotten or deemed unimportant and were paved over. A few short months later, Hurricane Donna unexpectedly veered toward Sanford in 1960. Roaring over the callously built expressway, Donna unleashed her wrath where the colony once lay, leaving construction halted for over a year. Drivers taking I-4 over Lake Monroe have reported strange interference on their radios and some claim to have seen ghostly apparitions on the road. Some long-haul truckers have claimed that their CB radios blast with static while driving over the stretch of highway, while other drivers report seeing ghostly shapes darting across the freeway only to vanish. Disembodied voices whisper urgent warnings. Even psychics insist tortured spirits linger from deadly pileups seeking justice or reconciliation. While no evidence substantiates the paranormal accounts, the stories persist. Perhaps the tragedy itself invites rumors of hauntings. Hundreds of people losing their lives so abruptly and violently must imprint something metaphysical. People impulsively seek deeper cosmic explanations when confronted by realities so harsh. The notion that restless spirits or dark forces conspire around the death zone offers, oddly, a more comforting narrative. External supernatural causes rather than random chance alone orchestrating such pain. The morbid mystique, even if more myth than fact, further cements this part of I-4 as uniquely precarious in the public consciousness. It certainly imbues driving through the area with heightened fear and tension. Even beyond potential paranormal activity, there is a very real danger to those journeying along Interstate 4 near Orlando. So if you ever find yourself driving through the dead zone, be aware of what's going on around you, or you might just end up a permanent resident. In a small Pacific Northwest town, Brian, a man in his mid-forties, led a life haunted by bizarre encounters and unexplained lost time events since childhood. These eerie episodes, shrouded in mystery, plagued Brian and his family, leaving them searching for answers. Despite his attempts to lead a normal life, Brian's struggles persisted, affecting his career and relationships ultimately leading to his untimely demise. We delve here into the enigmatic world of lost time and abduction experiences, 
using Brian's story as a lens to explore the hardships faced by those who endure such encounters. It calls for a shift in societal attitudes, urging us to seek understanding rather than perpetuating ignorance and dismissing the profound impact these experiences have on individuals. Brian's journey into the unknown began at a young age when he experienced his first terrifying encounter. Waking up in the dead of night, paralyzed with fear, he would scream for help, only to find his father immobilized by the same eerie paralysis. These episodes, occurring when his mother worked night shifts, left the family bewildered with no explanation for these unexplained phenomena. As Brian grew older, his encounters took a more distinct form. At the age of eight, he came face to face with a tall, shadowy being, frozen in fear as it approached him. The traumatic event left an indelible mark on Brian, intensifying his dread and setting the stage for a lifetime of anxiety and uncertainty. Despite the ongoing nightmares, Brian strived to lead a normal life during his teenage years. He enlisted in the military, hoping for stability and purpose. However, his encounters persisted, leading to occasional lost time events that left him bewildered and cost him employment opportunities. The strain on his marriage and family life grew as he struggled to provide stability amidst the chaos of his experiences. Brian's encounters escalated in intensity. His occasional disappearances for hours during routine tasks left him disoriented and fearful. The unexplained lost time events took a toll on his employment, exacerbating financial strain. Alongside his job instability, Brian's health deteriorated, suffering from unexplained stomach issues that progressively worsened, ultimately leading to hospitalization, where he was treated for the flu and released. A turning point in Brian's life occurred during a distressing lost time event, leaving him disoriented for two days. When he finally regained consciousness, he discovered himself sitting on the steps of the town library, dressed in unfamiliar clothes. The shock deepened as his wife accused him of infidelity due to extensive bruising in his private area. His marriage crumbled, and his family left in fear, unable to comprehend the enigma that consumed Brian's existence. Brian's health continued to deteriorate, both physically and mentally. His encounters with unknown beings became clearer in his recollections, but the gaps in memory remained frustratingly elusive. Despite reaching out to medical professionals and seeking help, he found no solace or understanding. With mounting despair, he succumbed to the physical and emotional toll, tragically passing away at the age of 49. Brian's story, though tragic, sheds light on the struggles faced by many who experience lost time and abduction events. Their encounters often leave lasting physical and psychological scars, yet society dismisses them as delusions or attention-seeking. The lack of understanding and support perpetuates the isolation and suffering of those who endure these inexplicable ordeals. To truly comprehend the complexities of the human experience, we must confront the unknown with empathy and an open mind. It is essential to foster a compassionate dialogue and encourage further research into these phenomena. By doing so, we can provide a glimmer of hope and understanding to individuals like Brian, who endured a lifetime of hardship, seeking answers that eluded him until the very end. In an age of enlightenment and scientific progress, it is incumbent upon us to challenge our preconceived notions, embrace the mysteries that surround us, and strive to uncover the truth. Only then can we offer solace and support to those who have fallen victim to these experiences, providing a much-needed ray of compassion in an otherwise bewildering world. It was March 1997 when the world woke up to the shocking news. Thirty-nine members of a cult called Heaven's Gate had committed mass suicide in a secluded mansion in San Diego, California. They were found lying dead, dressed identically in black shirts, 
sweatpants, and Nike sneakers, with bags over their heads. Each had a five-dollar bill and three-quarters in their pockets for interplanetary toll fare after they entered the so-called evolutionary level above human. This was one of the most bizarre and tragic ends of a new religious movement that started over two decades prior. To begin to understand this group and what led them down this ultimate path, we need to dive into their history, beliefs, and inner workings. Heaven's Gate was founded in 1974 by Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, two Texans who met in a psychiatric hospital during the height of the hippie movement. Applewhite was recovering from a heart attack and struggling with his sexuality, while Nettles was an occult dabbling nurse. During their stay, they had an epiphany that they were the two witnesses prophesied in the Book of Revelations who would preach of apocalyptic events ushering in the kingdom of heaven. They came to believe they were aliens from the next level, tasked with helping humans evolve to a higher plane of existence. The two began traveling around the American West in the 1970s, blending aspects of apocalyptic Christianity, science fiction, and benevolent alien intervention. They started recruiting followers to help spread their message. Their belief system had a strong, dualistic worldview that the body was just a vehicle in which the inner soul or spirit could ascend into higher realms. This higher level was a physical dimension ruled by beings more advanced than humans they called the next level. For their followers to reach this exalted plane, they needed to shed human attachments and desires, much like Buddhist monks seeking nirvana. Over the next two decades, Heaven's Gate followed an itinerant lifestyle as they proselytized while waiting to ascend. They supported themselves with website development businesses, running popular sites for companies like AT&T and CBS. Many in the group showed strong technical skills that made them income without requiring traditional jobs. They lived communally, first in campsites around western wilderness areas and later in rented houses. Members often worked jobs in whichever community they temporarily settled in. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, their message attracted over 200 devotees, with a committed core group of several dozen members by the mid-90s. Central to their beliefs was that Earth was facing an imminent recycling or apocalyptic cleansing akin to the great biblical flood, but this time by unnamed extraterrestrial forces instead of God. To avoid this doom, followers needed to prepare mentally, physically, and spiritually to transition to the next level above human existence. This transition required severing all human attachments, relationships, and sexuality. New members went through a rigorous initiatory process requiring them to abandon worldly possessions and ties. This was made easier by the communal living, common wardrobe, and uniform shaved hairstyles members adopted. Interestingly, the group allowed members to leave if they chose during a rare public interview in the 1970s. Applewhite and Newton explained that while they had the only truth, they couldn't convince anyone against their will. They preferred losing members rather than compelling anyone unwillingly, which appealed to recruits. This distinguished Heaven's Gate from notoriously controlling cults like Jim Jones' People's Temple. Members were free to walk away earlier on if the rigorous lifestyle didn't appeal to them. By the 1990s, Applewhite had prophesied the group would ascend in their physical bodies rather than just spiritual forms. They increasingly saw human existence as irredeemable and corrupt. Mainstream society became the system that members needed to separate from. When the 1995 comet Hale-Bopp appeared, members' thoughts gravitated towards it as a cosmic sign for them to ascend onto the UFO hiding behind it. In October 1996, Applewhite rented a large mansion and filmed the exit videos, where members joyously announced their upcoming graduation to the next level via shedding their containers. The suicides were carefully planned, orderly, and willfully chosen rather than coerced. What drove nearly 40 intelligent, functional adults to choose death? 
Former members noted Applewhite's magnetic charm and serene manner he used to persuade recruits. They paint him as a benevolent, wise teacher rather than a domineering cult leader. He focused on gradual indoctrination through Bible-focused Socratic questioning, esoteric diagrams of evolutionary taxonomy, and late-night philosophical discussions. His goal was getting members to adopt a radically dualistic worldview separating mind and body rather than exploiting followers. Former member Rio D'Angelo describes Applewhite's uncommon ability to personally transform the consciousness of members through these sessions. Over the years, he slowly elevated Applewhite and Nettles to prophets and eventually mythic alien beings. Followers believed they carried souls originating from the next level needed to follow in order to return there. By severing human attachments rather than serving some vengeful god, they believed they were demonstrating the ultimate commitment that proved their spiritual worthiness. With such a radical belief system, suicide became the natural final act of faith that allowed them to ascend back to their true homes. Of interesting note, the group also showed an early fascination with technology as part of separating from earthly existence. They were early adopters of mobile devices and computing. They leveraged income from running popular websites in the 1990s while proselytizing around the country. In their final exit videos, members mused about how they would rendezvous with a UFO hiding behind hale bopp Comet via shedding their containers. It seemed symbols of technology and advancement were an integral part of their dualistic theology and others. The tragedy of Heaven's Gate still looms large over American culture's view of cults, fringe spiritualism, and radical belief. It serves as a sobering reminder of how even intelligent individuals can become deeply swayed under the right conditions into bizarre views of reality that make the unthinkable inevitable. What we learned from studying this group is that its members were not mind-controlled slaves to crazed leaders, but earnest spiritual seekers who found meaning in Applewhite's unorthodox theology. They faced the ultimate fear of death and chose to confront it with courage fueled by their Slavic beliefs. As bizarre as their beliefs may seem to outsiders, for insiders they provided the ultimate comfort, an escape from uncertain earthly existence into cosmic advancement the promised land that ancient religions could only envision literally lay before them. The seductiveness of such literalistic mythic beliefs still allure some segments of humanity even in our scientific age. They fill a longing for purpose and meaning beyond the mundane cycles of normal life. Human passions are inflamed by suppressed desires and world-weary disaffection. Heaven's Gate represents one such extreme but telling example of this impulse, one that serves as a sociological lesson in beliefs and belonging, and why rationality does not always prevail, even with intelligent minds. Their strange journey reflects the twisting path humanity treads in balancing reason and wonder on the road to truth. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.